good morning, everybody, and, and thank you very much indeed for the invitation to come and speak to you. Um, my name is Paul Boyle. I, I'm the chief executive of one of the research funding agencies in the United Kingdom, the Economic and Social Research Council, so we're in charge of funding social science research in the UK. Uh, I'm also president of Science Europe, and I'm going to give you a few slides just to describing very briefly what Science Europe is for those of you who may not have heard of us yet. And then I'll go on to talk firstly about, uh, from the point of view of a research funder and a, and a set of research funding agencies, uh, why we have a concern about gender issues, what is some of the evidence that suggests that there is a real need for us to address this, and then, of course, go on to talk a little bit about what it is that we hope we're going to be able to achieve through Science Europe to help address some of those problems that we can identify. So, very briefly, just so that you have an understanding of what our organization is about, uh, Science Europe's mission is to bring together its member organizations, uh, of which we have over 50, um, to work towards a, a unified, better approach to science. We want to help design a European research system which will be an improvement on what we have today. So the aim of all of us is to think hard about how we go work together in that aim. We were established to try and bring a strong voice for scientists to the European Commission, to other collaborating partners, be they in Europe or across the world, so that we could make sure there was a single voice for scientists through our organization. And our argument, of course, is that while there's an awful lot of variation in Europe in terms of research funding, which we would encourage, there's also, of course, collective interest. There are things that we as funding agencies can do together that might improve on what we can do individually. We do engage a lot with the European Commission, so we are technically one of the uh, stakeholders that they work alongside, uh, particularly in relation to the European research area, but also in other areas too. And Science Europe came about through uh, two organizations originally, something called Eurohawks, the European Heads of Research Councils, uh, which ended the day before Science Europe was born, and the European Science Foundation which is gradually winding down and will wind down by uh, 2015. So Science Europe is a single organization that takes on the roles of European Science Foundation and Eurohawks. But critically, it's not a new funding agency. We're not putting in funding programs in much the same way that uh, European Science Foundation did, to some degree at least. Um, we're a policy organization. We're an organization that is trying to deliver better science in a whole variety of areas. And of course, one of those areas is gender and diversity. Critically, we bring together two types of organizations. Uh, organizations like my own, which is a research funding organization. So we would give out grants primarily to people working in universities to conduct research. They compete for those grants on a project by project basis. But we also support a number of research performing organizations, organizations like the Max Planck in Germany or CNRS in France, organizations that run their own institutes, employ their own staff, and these institutes might run for many, many years. So two types of organizations. We have 52 members spanning 27 countries. So we pretty much have all the main funding organizations in Europe. And annually, we have a budget combined of around about 30 billion euros. That's probably an underestimate because if you included other uh, allocations to things like CERN, it would be much larger. So we have a very considerable budget and one that, of course, is used in a variety of different ways in different countries depending on the organization. Critically, these are organizations that are independent of government. They're not for profit, but generally speaking, they're organizations that get their income from the taxpayer. So we, we are based on government funding uh, although we are all independent, and it is a, a, an aspect of Science Europe that you are expected to be an independent organization. A whole series of goals, and I'm not going to go through these in any detail, but if you go to our website, you'll be able to have a look in more detail about the sorts of things we're trying to do. Um, a whole set of ambitions there, including, as I said earlier, working towards uh, an improved European research area, um, and also trying to make sure that we encourage more collaborative, collaborative action across our member organizations, both in terms of sharing grants, but in a whole range of other areas. This is very simply uh, our roadmap. 
if, if it looks simple. I'm not sure it does look simple, but uh, it is simple if I describe it to you. So the, the, the four key parts of our roadmaps are in those circles. Our key aims are that we want to support borderless science. I want to allow researchers to work across borders wherever they wish, whether that's within Europe or across international borders outside of Europe. We want to facilitate science. So our ultimate goal, of course, is to provide an environment in which we end up producing better science. We want to improve the scientific environment. So we want to make sure that the laboratories, the place in which people conduct science is improved, the collaborative facilities that we need across Europe, the large infrastructure and so on. And we want to do a better job of communicating science, of engaging with the public and others about the good work that we do and why it's vital to continue supporting that work. And through that, we have a whole series, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to read them from the back, but a whole series of different areas that we have working groups established to focus on. And of course, the working group that is of particular relevance to this meeting is the Gender and Di Other Diversity Issues Working Group. All of these groups uh, are working uh, from using a number of different people from across the member organizations, people who have expertise in the particular areas that we're addressing. So we have people working on access to research data, open access to publications, research careers, and as I say, the working group of particular relevance today is our gender and other diversity issues working group. Let me step back, though, and think about what is the problem. And in fact, of course, I'm probably preaching here to the converted. I think many of you will already be aware of the sorts of issues that we have to grapple with as funding agencies. But here are a few slides that remind us of some of the critical problems. Well, to begin with, perhaps a positive story. Um, here we have a slide taken from the US. This is the uh, percentage of female PhDs, mainly in different social science uh, disciplines, but also with the physical sciences rolling along at the bottom there. And this shows you that there's been a very steep increase in the proportion of women who are graduating with PhDs in different disciplines. Indeed, in many social science disciplines now, there may even be an issue about the lack of men graduating with PhDs. In clinical psychology, you have over 70% of PhDs are female. So this, potentially at least, is a good news story. Since the 1970s, we've seen a very rapid increase in the number of women who are participating in the social sciences, at least. But of course, that story does not hold true when you look across uh, the different elements of uh, the, the uh, whole science spectrum. So here, we're looking at the left-hand side of the diagram from undergraduate proportions of women to the right, which is pro professorial proportions. These are data from the UK. And you can see very clearly that while women are doing quite well at undergraduate and postgraduate level, the numbers fall off very considerably when you get up to more senior levels of academic endeavor. You can see at the very end on the right as well, uh, the medium, uh, median academic pay gap remains uh, to the deficit of women. We also know that there's unconscious gender bias in a lot of assessment of research. And we know that this is true both for men and women. So when both men and women are assessing applications, they tend to be uh, pushing towards men rather than women. We know, for example, that women uh, or mothers are less likely to be promoted and have lower salaries than non-mothers. We know that Brian is more likely to be hired than Karen if identical CVs are submitted to panels but with male or female names. The male is more likely to be hired than the woman. And this has been confirmed quite recently by a double-blind randomized co control trial, which effectively proves that men are more likely to be employed despite having identical characteristics to women. We also know that women win fewer prizes and awards in academia. Some describe this as the Matilda effect, and has led, some would argue, to a ghettoization. There is an issue here about whether it's a good idea to introduce women-only prizes or not. Is that something that will help rectify the imbalance, or is it something which ghettoizes women into women-only awards? However, it seems to be true that women's papers, academic papers, are as likely to be accepted for publication as men's. And of course, that suggests, as we would imagine, that there should be no difference whatsoever in the quality of the science coming from men from women. So this is a good news story. It's also interesting to find that women are actually tougher reviewers than men. So if you have a panel that includes a higher proportion of women, 
it's more likely to turn down grants than a panel that has higher proportions of men, which is an interesting difference. We know that women are less likely to submit grant applications than men, and this is where we get to the heart of the issues that our funding agencies are particularly concerned about. Women with dependent children are less likely to submit than men with dependent children. Women are less senior and, of course, are excluded from some of the schemes, and that may explain part of the difference, but not all of it. Debatably, though, women's grant success is similar to men's, and there is some debate here, and this varies across different national contexts. But the most recent evidence does seem to suggest, when you do a meta-analysis, that women's grant success is, generally speaking, equivalent to men's. If you look in Australia, there appears to be no difference in success rates. So women might be less likely to submit grants, but once they've submitted the grants, they appear to be as successful as men. This meta-analysis by Marsh across a range of disciplines and countries also seems to suggest there's no significant difference between men and women's success rates in grants. It seems to be true in Austria, where a recent study also found the same. And just out of interest for my own research council, in the last year, our success rates are 35% for women and 31% for men. So that all leads us to suggest that women's success, at least, in grants is something that is a good news story. But of course, we do find situations where that's not true. And we have to think very carefully about if it is true in general that women do well compared to men, or at least as, as well as men, why is it in some circumstances they don't? One of those circumstances is the European Research Council grants. And here we see that women uh, submit less than men, so only 25% of the applications come from women. OK, so there are submission rates. We know there are differences in men and women uh, across many other grant systems in the world. But it is also true that in the ERC, only 20% of the awardees are women. So it appears that women's success in grants in the ERC is less than men's. And that's an interesting finding and one that we need to take away and think very carefully about. If I look to the research councils of the United Kingdom, the difference is actually much smaller and debatably uh, not significant. So here you do find that men are more successful than women. If you look to the right, you see in total over all the research councils in the UK, so we have seven research councils, each in different areas of uh, science, we have a difference of two percentage points between men and women in the data here for one year. And actually, if you look across the years, there's a little bit of fluctuation in that. Interestingly, you can see that for all the research councils, there are only two where women's success rates are higher than those of men, and that's my own research council, the social sciences, and the arts and humanities. In all the other disciplines, you find a small uh, difference between men and women. So these uh, are still something that I think we need to be conscious and concerned about. And then finally, we also see that women are less likely to be awarded large grants. RAND did some work on this uh, in the early 2000s, which suggests that uh, women are awarded smaller grants, so forgetting whether they're more successful or less successful, how large is the grant that women are awarded compared to men? And the most recent and robust evidence I've seen comes from the Wellcome Trust in the United Kingdom, which analyzed data from 2000 to 2008 and showed that controlling for uh, the rank of the person, uh, men got grants which are on average about £45,000 more expensive than the grants that women got. This could be that women are systematically less, ex less ambitious than men, or it could be that women are more realistic about the costs of their grant when they apply. It's difficult to know which, but for some reason women are applying for and being awarded smaller grants than men. So what is Science Europe concerned about and what is it doing? Well, we're concerned, and I should stress here, that while gender is a, a, an absolute priority for us, the group that we have is equally as concerned about other diversity issues. And I'm going to end my very final point of the talk, is that we know an awful lot more about gender disparity than we do about ethnic disability and other elements of diversity. So our group is going to be working on all these elements, although, of course, gender is a critical one of those. And the aim, of course, is to try and bring our members together to uh, encourage good practice. We're going to be looking at a whole range of things. This is not just about grants and how many grants have been awarded. It's about human resources around recruitment, retention, and career progression. Remembering, of course, that some of our organizations are indeed research performing organizations. They recruit and so on, while others are research funders. We'll be looking at the research process. Are there biases inherent in peer review and are there things we can do about that? We'll be looking at the research content, 
a design implementation of research. We also need to think about it as members from the point of view of employers, as research funders, and as knowledge providers. So it's a diverse territory, and a lot of hard work needs to look at a whole range of different issues, not just simply why it may be the case that women's grants are smaller than men's or that their success rates may or may not be slightly different. I'm not going to read through these. I'm going to rush through them. But if you look at just the bold elements of this, if you look at the Science Europe Roadmap, which is available on the web, uh, you'll find the objectives that we've stated there. The bold points are perhaps worth pulling out that we'll, we'll be establishing across all our member organizations action plans to try and improve the situation for women compared to men. We'll be scrutinizing the peer review process, as I said earlier. We'll be promoting policy and research initiatives and monitoring the impact of funding investments and instruments. We'll be sharing good practice and we'll be collecting a lot of evidence about difference across our member organizations. Of course, in the end, we need to think hard about how the design, implementation, and content of the very research itself also plays a part in resolving some of these gender differences. How do we add value? And of course, one of the issues for us is there's a whole range of different initiatives, indeed including this meeting, but many other initiatives thinking hard about gender differences in science. You can see, and I won't read them all out, but a list of organizations that are already paying quite a lot of attention to this issue including, of course, the Gender Summit that was held in North uh, America, and something called the Global Research Council, which is sort of similar to Science Europe, except that it works on a global basis and brings together funders from across the world. And again, gender and diversity issues is something that the Global Research Council has also shown some considerable interest in. Well, our Gender and Diversity Working Group kicked off its first meeting in May 2014. It's argued right from the beginning that it needs to be complementary to all these other activities. We're not going to try and duplicate all the hard work that's been done before. We will be advocating a whole series of different dimensions that we will put forward to our member organizations and encourage them to engage with. The group includes 14 experts from our different uh, research performing and funding agencies, and they've been brought together because they are experts in the field of these diversity issues. Uh, and they will be then looking at helping us develop a series of policies that we can implement across the board, across all 52 of our agencies. So the aim, of course, is to come up with a portfolio of instruments that will help us resolve some of the problems that I've described earlier. Finally, let me just give you some information about how we do as funding organizations, and the picture is not great. One of the problems, of course, is that Science Europe is made up the, of the heads of the funding agencies and research performing organizations in Europe. And you can see that the heads that have been elected to these organizations, including me, are predominantly male. 44 of the heads of the 52 organizations are male, and only eight are women. And in a sense, this is a difficult problem for Science Europe. We have no influence over this. This is the process which each national uh, government goes through in appointing the people to the head up their funding agencies. I, sh <clears throat> I should say uh, that over the years that I've been president of Science Europe, things have improved because when I started just a couple of years ago, I think there were two women uh, rather than eight. But even so, there's still a very significant difference. However, if you look at our governing board, you can see that we have taken steps to try and make sure that we can even up the balance as much as we can. So, okay, it's still only three compared to nine but the proportion of women is slightly higher, at least on our governing board, than it is among all of our member organizations. And if you look at our scientific committees, so we have six scientific committees that we've established, and these are established with experts from different scientific areas. If you look at all six committees, 27 compared to 58 are women compared to men, so about 31% of the members of the scientific committees that we've established are women. But of course, you will see great diversity across the different committees that we have, not surprisingly, because there are different proportions of men and women in those disciplines. If you look to social sciences and humanities, you can see our scientific committees have more women on them than men. On the other hand, if you look at every other discipline-based committee, there will be more men than women, and in some areas, quite extreme differences compared to men and women. So this, again, is something that we need to think carefully about. So what have we done? Well, admittedly, only some very small steps to begin with. First of all, our scientific committees are now going through a process of recruiting new members. We've been two years in, it's time to recruit new members. And we've introduced a rule 
The members get put forward by our member organisations and any member organisation who recommends a person to go on our scientific committee, if they recommend a man, they must recommend a woman, or vice versa. If they recommend a woman, they must recommend a man. And this, we hope, although it may not guarantee that in the, ele in the end the election to the positions will be biased towards women, it does at least mean there will be 50% men and 50% women going into those elections. So it's a small step in the right direction. On our governing board, we have three criteria for electing people to our governing board. We need to balance where we can between our research for performing and funding organisations. We want to make sure there's a balance geographically to encourage members for, on our governing board to come from southern, eastern, western Europe and so on. And we also make it clear that we want to be at least to some degree biased towards women in that process to try and even up the men and women on our governing board. And you can see that over time we've been able to do that gradually over time. And of course we do do a host of other things including a high level conference once a year where gender and diversity issues were a major part of that conference last year. So in conclusion, despite some progress, and I showed you in some of the slides that there is, that there is some progress, I think, women are still underrepresented in senior positions in science. We do need to open up the thorny question of quotas, and we know that in some countries, like Norway, who have a 40% quota on their public uh, limited company boards, and indeed some other countries that have followed suit, not necessarily with 40%, but certainly imposing some sort of quota element. It's very interesting that a recent paper has come out by a, a pair of economists that argues gender quotas are actually a good thing for a whole variety of reasons, and one of the points they make is that it discourages men who are less efficient in forming human capital and encourages women who are more efficient in forming human capital if you have quotas. So there's some academic evidence, some theoretical e econometrics, that suggests that perhaps quotas are a good thing, but we can debate whether or not we agree that quotas are the right approach or not. We certainly need more training, unconscious bias training, something that the UK research councils are now implementing. We need to involve more women in the decision making and mentoring, and that of course is something that we're already working on. And we need to act together as research performers and research funders. In the UK NIHR, which is a health-based funder, will only give grants to departments who have been awarded the Silver uh, Swan Athena Award. This is actually quite a testing award that shows that departments have worked very hard towards gender balance. And in this particular funding agency has taken a firm decision that no department in the UK, other than those that have this award, will be eligible for their grants. A very bold move and an interesting move to discuss. In Norway, and in, indeed you can see many of the examples come from Scandinavia, which I think is probably fair to say is leading the way in Europe in some of its gender issues. In Norway, there are extra funds to universities who appoint women uh, in underrepresented disciplines. So more money goes to a university if they appoint women compared to men. There's a gender balance in research committee, which spends a lot of time working across institutions to encourage gender issues to be considered seriously. In Finland, there are gender equality awards. <coughs> And women hold an academy of professorships has been improved quite remarkably from 13% in 2009 to 22% in 2010, partly attributable to these awards. 50% of women on the Academy of Finland Board and Scientific Committees uh, rather than uh, what we see, for example, in Science Europe and elsewhere. And in Denmark, there are some grant schemes which are women only. Again, we can go back to this issue about ghettoization and whether this is the right approach, but even so, uh, they have some schemes, particularly in the STEM subjects, where only women can apply, another way of encouraging women to come forward in those disciplines. And they also have schemes available for training only women in management and other issues to try and make sure that more women end up on the boards and major funding agency positions in the future. So my final point, and I said it right at the beginning, I hope you could see that Science Europe is doing a lot to try and think hard about gender diversity and gender issues, but we do, of course, and it maybe isn't for discussion necessarily today, but we also need to think very hard about ethnic disability and other forms of diversity as we go forward. There's a lot of work being done on gender, quite rightly, and we will continue with that, but there's been much less work, of course, in some of these other areas. So uh, I'll finish there. Thank you very much.